A new, more contagious variant of the coronavirus could be behind a more serious second wave in South Africa. B1351 could also be the first mutation to beat an existing vaccine. A small study shows the AstraZeneca inoculation only offers limited protection against mild versions of the variant. And that's the vaccine much of Africa was banking on. Well, in a moment, we'll talk to a virologist involved in that AstraZeneca study and put this into context. But first, let's look at some of the other factors driving case numbers in South Africa. Super spreader events and lockdown fatigue are also being blamed. As the developed world gathers momentum in vaccinating its populations, South Africa is fighting a coronavirus mutation. South Africa has just come out of its second wave of coronavirus infections within the last period of 2020. Uh, and us as a research institute are very concerned that this may or may not be related to the new strain of coronavirus infections which has been found within the country. The variant has been associated with a higher viral load in infected people, making it more transmissible and leading to sharp spikes in infections. South Africa recorded over 15,000 COVID deaths in the last month, and its hospitals were filled to capacity. So we have had um, an unexpectedly strong second wave in South Africa. It came earlier than we'd anticipated, and it was much steeper in terms of numbers. There were two reasons for this. One was, we think, mass gatherings. Uh, before the Christmas period, there were young people getting together, but also that we hadn't really controlled the numbers of people, for example, at funerals. So mass gatherings drove this partly, but that coincided with the emergence of the new variant, which has indeed increased transmission from one person to another. So two things concurred at the same time. This seems to be confirmed by researchers on the ground. We find that participants, particularly in our research setting, have not been compliant to non-pharmaceutical interventions. They've been non-compliant to travelling restrictions, uh, particularly across provinces. They've also been non-compliant to self-isolation after testing positive, as well as uh, attending parties. Adherence to personal protection measures are also slipping. Like in Maboneng, an inner-city cultural hub in Johannesburg, I'm having some hot water and honey and ginger and when I do drink it and I spill it makes the mask wet so that's why I remove the mask but other than drinking the water and singing it's on. Locals are beginning to tire of some of the world's strictest lockdown measures and skepticism is taking hold. There's no corona dog. The, that shit doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. They, they basically trying to fuck with our minds, you know? While struggling entrepreneurs are taking risks in order to survive. Are you good? It's very difficult to adhere to the rules of social distancing and wearing masks fully. So that's a bit of a challenge. But, you know, as a you know, restaurant owner, you know, I don't want to chase the last little client that I have. So I'll do all that I can just to try and keep and keep, you know, keep the shop open. Exactly what role the recently discovered variant is playing in local infection rates remains to be seen. We are not particularly sure about what this, this coronavirus infection strain will do in terms of the medication and the vaccines we have thus far developed. Uh, we are hoping to have some very exciting information in the next few weeks which will answer some of those questions um, and give us some more guidance around this particular issue. But until scientists can be sure, South Africa needs to remain cautious as vaccine rollout has only just begun. New variants and the efficacy of vaccines. Let's talk about that with virologist Penny Moore. She joins us from Wits University and the National Institute for Communicable Diseases and contributed to the laboratory aspect of this South African study on the AstraZeneca vaccine. Penny, what's the main takeaway from this study? The main takeaway, unfortunately, is that the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was tested in a relatively small trial in South Africa, shows virtually no efficacy against the variant that was described in South Africa. And for that reason, the South African government has temporarily suspended rollout of that vaccine in South Africa.
How much of this is a blow or how much of a blow is this to the country's efforts to combat the pandemic, considering it is just a, a small study, you said? It is a blow in the sense that this is the vaccine that has um, arrived in South Africa. We have um, access to stocks of the vaccine in South Africa and the rollout was literally expected to begin any day. Um, however, it's not the only vaccine. Um, recent data from two other trials has shown some efficacy against the South African variant. And so the hope is that we'll be able to rapidly roll out um, other vaccines to combat um, COVID-19 in South Africa. But this new variant is the one that's spread among, what, 90% of the population and, and, and a lot of young people, I believe. Well, it's the dominant variant across across our country now. You know, it was first detected um, in late October, um, and since then it has swept across our country. Um, it is now, the, as you say, the dominant variant in, in every province in South Africa. And it's now moved beyond South Africa despite a fairly strict lockdown and has been detected in several other countries across the world. So many African countries have young populations, so I guess this is quite a concern if this is the variant that's going to spread across Africa. Well, you know, it happens to have infected many young people in South Africa, but um, that is a consequence um, of our demographics rather than of the virus. Um, I suspect if this virus was um, detected, and it will be detected, it has been detected elsewhere, it'll track the epidemic that has been observed with most of the other variants across the world. How, how likely is this going to become the most dominant uh, variant worldwide, do you think? Yeah, I mean, viruses don't respect borders, as you can imagine. Um, there has been a concerted effort to keep the South African variant out of other countries. Um, but people do travel, um, and the variant, as I mentioned, has been detected elsewhere. Um, it's not just a, a case of worrying about this particular variant. Um, I think it's a, it's a broader problem that we need to be aware of. This, the same set of mutations that define the South African variant have been very much detected in other, in other variants across the world, including now in, in Brazil and in the UK. And so it's, it's not just the South African variant. It's a, it's a more general case of the virus evolving to become uh, better at dealing with our immune response. So it's not, a, it's, a, it's not a case of worrying about the South African variant. It's a case of worrying about um, evolution of this virus generally. So what are you saying? That it's mutating to the same pattern, basically? Yes, that's correct, yeah. So essentially what happens is that, is that people have a very similar immune response to this virus. Um, whether you look at an immune response in somebody infected with this virus in the UK or in Brazil or in South Africa or in the US, people's immune response see the virus in a very similar way. And for that reason, the virus chooses very similar ways to escape from the immune response. It's, it's an ongoing cat and mouse game that all viruses in, engage in with in response to host, host um, antibodies and T cells. But ju just clarify that for me. Is it is it a case of um, is it just chance that that it mutates in that same pattern, or or is there some sort of communication between these viruses? No, there's no communication between the viruses. But vi viruses um, are targeted by the immune system in very much the same way. So so there is a certain part of the virus um, called the receptor binding domain that is the main part of the virus that is seen by the immune system. And that is the main target, and therefore the virus um, tries its very best to, to mutate away from antibodies that target that site. It happens to be targeted equivalently across the world, and there's a single or three mutations, for example, that enable the virus to very rapidly get away from those antibodies. And so it's, it's converging to the same way of getting away from, from a very conserved immune response that all humans seem to have to this virus. So, Penny, at the end of the day, what's it mean for AstraZeneca and its vaccine? Well, AstraZeneca, like all the vaccine manufacturers, are rapidly tailoring their, their vaccine to be able to deal with this variant um, and to deal with other variants that are emerging that have the same mutations. Um, the next question, of course, will be what happens after that. Um, this is a virus that's going to continue to mutate. Um, this is not a once-off um, event. We've seen it before. Even with SARS-CoV-2, we will see it again. And so the question is, how do we deal with that on an ongoing and continuous basis. Um, we will now watch that the major manufacturers tailor their vaccines, and then we will have to see what happens after that. I suspect this will turn into a very similar scenario to what happens with the influenza vaccines, where we receive a, a new and slightly different vaccine every year to combat that virus. I suspect we will do the same for SARS-CoV-2 in the future. But in this case, not only could this be the first vaccine that's been made ineffective by the coronavirus, it's, it's also 
not proving effective against older people in other countries and then young populations in Africa? I think uh, there is there is a there are benefits and and disadvantages to every vaccine. Um, AstraZeneca is a very cost effective vaccine, um, and many of the other vaccines may have, um, for example, higher levels of efficacy in some groups, but are much harder to roll out into some populations. When we think about vaccines for for South Africa and for any country, we are balancing all of those things together. We're balancing efficacy in various populations. We're balancing coverage. How easily can we roll a vaccine out across across an entire country to achieve some level of herd protection? Um, that may be harder now um, than we had predicted before. But you know, all vaccines come with pros and cons. Um, we've seen we've seen other vaccines also losing efficacy against um, the South African variant, and I suspect we'll see the same for the variant that is now coming out of Brazil. Um, but as we as we change all of these vaccines, we will continue to see an ongoing trade-off in in benefits and, and disadvantages for each vaccine that we'll need to consider carefully. And sorry to be such a pessimist, but um, this vaccine is the one that was bought up big by, by COVAX to distribute it to poorer countries. Um, I guess that's yet another setback for, um, for South Africa and the region. So a major thing to remember with this trial um, is that it, it failed to protect against um, mild and moderate disease. What we don't know is whether this vaccine is able to protect from severe disease. And for many people, uh, rolling out a vaccine across any country, prevention of severe disease, preventing people from dying, is actually the main thing we want to achieve. Um, we don't know yet whether the AstraZeneca vaccine can do that. And the reason is that we, this vaccine was tested in a group of people who with an average age of around about 30, and they tend not to experience severe disease. So we need to find out whether the AstraZeneca vaccine does protect against severe disease. And there's good reason to think it might. It uses a very similar platform to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Um, again, this is a non-replicating adenoviral vac vaccine. And that vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, did protect very effectively against severe disease. So I think there's still a lot we need to learn about the AstraZeneca vaccine. There's a lot we need to learn about all of these vaccines. We cannot um, extrapolate anything in my opinion, from one vaccine to another. We need to test in all situations. Virologist Penny Moore, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Ben. Time now for your questions. Over to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. As the SARS-CoV-2 virus inevitably continues to mutate, could it also mutate to become less deadly? This is complicated, but here goes. Um, the short answer is yes, that could happen, and, and we hope it will, but there's no guarantee. Um, scientists used to believe that pathogens always evolved to grow less deadly because it was thought a deadly disease is an ineffective disease. Uh, the reasoning was that if a pathogen kills its host, especially if it kills that host quickly, then it lowers its own chances of being passed on. So less deadly, more transmissible variants should have an evolutionary advantage, right? Well, the problem with that logic is that virulence can also be viewed as an advantage because the sicker the host grows, the more likely they are to give their pathogen to someone else, since they're shedding more of it. So, um, so we actually think there's kind of a, an evolutionary trade-off between transmissibility and virulence. And, and there are certainly pathogens, for instance, the tuberculosis bacterium, that have been infecting humans for thousands of years, yet still kill large numbers of people. To see what the future might hold for COVID-19, therefore, scientists have been looking at the other coronaviruses known to infect humans, in particular the four that we think have been doing it for quite a while. Um, they only cause mild, cold-like symptoms. Interestingly, that might have less to do with them and more to do with us, especially with our children. Um, one theory is that Repeated exposure to those other coronaviruses in early childhood uh, might be helping to prevent more severe cases of the sicknesses they could cause later in life. If SARS-CoV-2 does become an endemic background illness in our societies, then, then later generations of children will be exposed to it early at, at an age 
when it rarely makes you seriously ill, and, and that in turn should make subsequent exposures much less dangerous, or at least that's the hope. Thank you.